I'm really glad y'all are here. If uh, we haven't met, maybe you're new to the story. I've, I've been out for the last few weeks, and so been on sabbatical, first ever sabbatical. It was wonderful. It was awesome. If I haven't met you yet, I'm really glad you're here. Um, they say absence makes the heart grow fonder. That's true, because I have been missing y'all so much and missing this so much. I just love our community, and I was reminded of how deeply I love not just our church or our services, but our community um, at the story, and I just can't wait to see what the Lord does next with us. But wow, what a week. I know there's people here who still don't have power, people volunteering, serving up here or on the camera in the back or folks backstage that showed up to serve and don't have power at home. And so our city is still recovering from this uh, Jose Altuve of hurricanes, this little category one that turned our city upside down. Um, and, and like many of you, I went through all five stages of grief this week. Centerpoint ushered me through all five stages of grief <laughs> this week. I know there's probably like a Centerpoint employee here who's never going to write another check to the stories. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyway, just I'm speaking from my human side. It was the flesh talking, okay? But Monday was denial. Like at, at first you're like, well, this, this isn't that bad. This, we can learn something from this. You know, kids, let's learn a lesson. And then uh, quickly gave way, uh, you know, to anger. That's the second stage. And that was mostly uh, setting in on Tuesday, just the anger mostly directed at that little finger paint map they kept putting out, <laughs> which didn't really mean what it said it meant. And then Wednesday was bargaining with God. I'm like, I'll do anything, Lord. I'll do anything to get power back. Um, Thursday, I, I guess that's when the depression set in. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's the peak of it for me, I think, was Wednesday night into Thursday. I think when the storm came in the middle of the night, because my family was relying on a little portable generator, and I don't know if you know this about little portable generators. Uh, they don't, they're not made for the rain. And uh, that little machine has been looking for a reason to quit on me for years. And so I had this fear that, you know, all we had at that point were fans and phone chargers. And we're about to lose even that because of this rain that was coming in like 1.30, 2 a.m. It was a thunderstorm, like lightning and everything. And so being the man of the house, the protector of my family, I, uh, I got up from the couch where I was sleeping and, and uh, grabbed an umbrella, which was metal, by the way, went out to the lightning storm and uh, just stood in my backyard in my underwear holding a metal umbrella as the lightning and rain was all around me. And I have no idea how long I was out there because I'm certain I fell asleep for some time. Of that. I was standing up, falling asleep. And the next thing I remember is Giovanna, my wife, coming outside and just standing beside me. At first, she was like quiet, like just standing in solidarity with her husband. But I think she was trying to figure out how bad it's got with me. Like, I'm in my underwear in the backyard with an umbrella. And she's just wondering, you know, who do I call for this? And she says, uh, Eric, what are you doing? out here, and I said something like, my family. And then she said, Eric, what are you doing? And I said, I am not sure anymore. And then I just turned off the generator and went inside and sweltered in the heat for the duration of that, uh, of that storm. It only lasted another hour or two, but that was a long hour or two, right? And uh, that's when the depression really set in. Friday, by Friday, the depression had given way to acceptance. That's the final stage of, uh, of grief. And acceptance is the stage where every red-blooded man in Houston takes his phone and makes the call he's avoided making. Uh, hello, Generac. <laughs> uh, will you take my child's uh, college fund, please, in exchange for one of them generators? You know? And, uh, and then Saturday afternoon, just when I thought we were never going to get power back, it came back on. So the Huffmans are in the clear. I know not everybody is, so it's not, a, not trying to make anybody feel worse or anything. But, hey, you're welcome at, at the house. I, we've had people offering us. That's the church at its best, right? It's like when we reach out to others in times of need. And, and so at least we've had that opportunity. I, in fact, that's my prayer. Through all of this chaos we're living through now in our city, in our country, I hope, God shows you what it means to be a light shining in the darkness, even when that darkness is literal, like it was this week, because every crisis is an opportunity to be Jesus to the world around us. And so uh, as the church, that's who we're called to be. 
All right, so today what we're going to do with the rest of our time is uh, open up a new series of messages. This series is called Modern Heresies. It's been a series I've been looking forward to for some time now. We're going to do two things with this series. The first thing we're going to do is compare the prevailing dominant worldview in our secular culture, like the way most people understand the world. We're going to compare and contrast that with what we're calling the gospel worldview, the worldview of Christ and his people. But we're not going to stop there. It's not enough just to compare the secular world and to Christian worldview and say, well, we're right and they're wrong. That's not it. The, the main point of this series is to identify and discern the times and ways in which the secular worldview bleeds into the church and invades Christianity and, and corrupts Christian minds and hearts. It happens all the time. That's where heresies are born. That's why we're calling the series Modern Heresies. So to sort of set the table, let's get some definitions out of the way, shall we? First of all, what's a worldview? Well, a worldview is just a framework of beliefs and values through which a person or group of people interprets reality. Everybody has a worldview. It's not just religious people or political people that have a worldview. Even people who say, I don't have a worldview, that's their worldview is to reject all worldviews, supposedly, but that's, they contradict themselves. That's their worldview. Everybody has a, a point of view, a perspective through which they make sense of the world or define reality. So when we talk about a gospel worldview, what's the word gospel mean, especially for newcomers to Christianity, to the church? What I mean in this series with gospel is basically the Christian worldview. Like, that's as simply as I can sum it up. The gospel is the Christian worldview point of view, the Christian perspective that's based entirely on the free will, uh, the, the free gift of God's grace shown to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and it's available to every human being. This is the lens through which we look to see the world and make sense of it all. And finally, what do we mean with that big word heresy that has all kinds of baggage attached to it for this series? This purpose, I, I've just defined heresy as a false teaching or false belief that contradicts established truths. So when Christians lose their way, when preachers lose our way, when churches or denominations lose their way and get um, established truth wrong and mislead people, um, misinform, misguide, whatever, that is heresy in the works, okay? So everybody has a worldview. When I look at the dominant secular worldview, what I see and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be as generous, and I mean this, as generous as I can. The secular worldview typically is full of good intentions and bad ideas. Good intentions and bad ideas. And I mean it when I say most people who hold a secular worldview have the best of intentions. That's why some of the non-Christians, non-religious people that you know and live with and love and work with are day-to-day -day better people than many of the Christians that you go to church with. Because they're, it's not like they're not made in God's image. We know that they are. And so they have good in them. Their hearts are often good and well-intentioned. They have good, idea, good, good intentions and bad ideas. Now, the way you see this fleshing itself out is you see a, a secular culture like ours that by all appearances is committed to love. We just came out of Pride Month in our culture, and everywhere you look, you saw that mantra, love is love. Love is everything. You know, love is where it's at. Love is all you need. These cultural mantras about love are all over the place, but no one in that secular framework is able to really define love or to explain why people who are ostensibly committed to love so often give in to hate toward those who don't love the way they love. So there's no objectivity to the secular worldview, and that's often where it falls apart. The same goes with justice. There's a lot of talk about justice in our culture. What it tends to mean is we want justice for other people and mercy for ourselves, because if we really wanted justice for everyone, then it would, the weight of that would crush us all, because there's, there's no way to account for all of our sins um, that we all commit every day. We're all broken. We're all sinners. But the world says they want justice. They just don't understand it. The world will often march in uh, favor of what they call human rights. 
or women's rights or whoever's rights. And that's well-intentioned. I mean it. It's good intentions. It's a good sign whenever people march for such causes. But the problem is that many in that framework, many secular people, I would say most secular people would struggle to articulate why we should expect all human beings to have equal rights. What philosophical underpinnings are there other than just our feelings? I feel that everyone should be equal, that everyone should have rights. If you take the creator endowing us with those rights outside of secular government, out beyond secular institutions, then you're left with nothing but freedoms and rights that come from our institutions, from our governments, from our feelings. And that obviously is unsustainable. So the instinct is good, the follow through, not so much. So let's Take a look now at what the Christian answer is to that. This is what we're calling the gospel. The gospel worldview is summed up beautifully by um, the Apostle Paul in his first century letter called 2 Corinthians. And um, this is not usually the passage you would point to as like the succinct explanation of the gospel, but I love it for what it says for our purposes today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 20. Y'all have got study guides if you um, would like to follow along there. Or obviously, we'd love for you to open your Bibles. Sorry, two-thirds, three-fourths of the room is totally dark. One-fourth of the room in the light, saved, justified, redeemed. The rest of you, it's a metaphor. I'm just kidding. So, sorry. It's just we've taken most of our house lights down the hall to the sanctuary where construction's happening, and we'll be opening there soon. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 20. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. In other words, we no longer have a worldly um, worldview. We used to look at Jesus from a secular worldview, Paul is saying. Paul used to think Jesus was a false prophet, a heretic, right? He looked at Jesus from a worldly perspective. We no longer do, he says. Therefore, if anyone, anyone, I love that word, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. God has done something new in them. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God. It's all God's doing, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself, making this universal offer to everyone made in his image, reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us, Christians, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So what are the hallmarks of this worldview? Well, you see, it's not about me. It's not about what I can do what I can accomplish, what I should deserve or achieve. There's no merit in it other than the merit afforded to me through Christ and his work on my behalf. It's not self-sufficient. In fact, there's no such thing as self-sufficient Christianity or a self-sufficient Christian. There's only the all-sufficient saving work of Jesus in which we live and in which we glory and to which we respond All the good stuff we try to do as Christians isn't trying to get in God's good graces. We're already there by the miracle of grace and the cross and the empty tomb. That's the seal of God's promise that you're already okay in God's eyes. You're righteous by the righteousness imputed or afforded you through the cross. And so this is not a meritocracy. But when we look at the dominant worldview in our culture, it is very much a meritocracy, as much as it tries to say it isn't, it certainly is a meritocracy that's often sensual. We'll talk about the sensuality of the modern worldview in a couple weeks. We'll talk about the uh, ostensible commitment to science in our modern secular worldview in a, couple, in a few weeks. And uh, we'll talk about other things as well. But today I want to talk about how the secular worldview in which most people are living under is fully committed to the self. It is self-centered. And and so much so that most people don't even see it anymore. That's so common 
I mean, asking someone to identify the problem of self-centeredness in our culture today would be asking a fish to talk about what it's like to live in water. It's like it's all the fish ever knows. You can't imagine any other way. Most of us can't imagine living under any other set of assumptions than self-centeredness. But it hasn't always been this way. For most of human history, most people, most individuals understood themselves to be part of some greater whole. And so yourself was just a small part of a larger whole, maybe the part of a family. And you identified according to that family name, and you prioritized the well-being of the family above your own personal individual well-being. Or if it wasn't a family, it might have been a religious community or a village or tribe or nation or kingdom. People, for most of our history, have identified and valued through that lens uh, the community above the self. In recent years, we've seen that change where people are now valuing the self above whatever community or city or whatever we're part of. We've shifted toward individualism or what I'm calling selfism for this part of the series. Selfism is basically the belief that you are the center of your world. You are the center of your universe. And let's be real, it's not those bad non-Christians that live that way. We're all tempted to live that way. I mean, I was as mad as I could be at center point for most of the week until I got power back, and then I was over it. I was like, it's fine. Good job, center point. High five, because <laughs> I've got power now. You know, it's like there's still 400,000 people without it, but I'm good, so we're good. You know, it's like the self-centeredness is so deep that we don't even diagnose it or, or, or see it anymore, but that's how most of us are living, as though my well-being is paramount to me. I'm the most important person in my life. My personal happiness is like fundamental. My self-expression is my birthright. You know, we, we, we see the self-esteem, self-assurance sort of culture bubbling up all around us, especially if you're online, if you're on TikTok, or uh, if, if you're even on X or Twitter, whatever, if, if you're Facebook, if, if, if you're Instagram, whatever social media platforms you're on, you always are gonna be inundated with messaging that is pro-self-care, pro-self-fulfillment, pro-self-love, you know, pro-self-discovery, self-talk, self, uh, you'll see all kinds of stuff about the self. As one example, I'll share this little meme with you that it's just a, a very common type of meme that goes viral all the time, every day in our culture. And again, remember what I told you, good intentions, bad ideas, okay? This comes from someone posting under the Happy Whole Way brand or something, and they say the heading is religious beliefs to unlearn. So this is a message for people who are walking away from religion and deconstructing faith or Christianity, in our case, whatever the case may be. And this is what you have to unlearn, bad things that religious people will teach you that you have to unlearn. And it goes all the way around, the, runs the gamut here. There's only one right way to live. I'm broken and need to be saved. I can't trust myself. I'm nothing without God. My desires are sinful. Your spiritual self is all that matters. I'm responsible responsible for saving others. These are the lies that religion tells us that we have to unlearn. Here's the thing. This is a very tempting set of beliefs to ascribe to. Like on the surface, if you're not a discerning person, if you're not a deep thinker, it's easy to fall prey to something like this because it sounds nice and feels good. Right? I don't want to be like those religious people that I know. And so this, this seems to be the antidote to that. But listen, guys, let's be more discerning than that. Let's be critical thinkers here. On the one hand, I'll acknowledge I'm kind of with this person as far as religion goes. I'm no fan of religion either. Might come as a surprise to you because I'm a preacher, but I am not a fan of religion. The only reason, one of the reasons I'm a Christian is because when I read the New Testament, I didn't find just another religion there. I didn't find Jesus to be the typical religious leader. He's different. He's unique. He stands out. He has an offer of religious exchange, a transactional thing, where if you do enough good things, God will be good enough to you. That's how I understand religions to function generally in the world, right? It's sort of an institutional set of like 
negotiating tactics to keep the gods off your back. And these gods are always angry with you or they're distant. They don't care about you. So you're just trying to keep them off your back, get in their good graces. That's how religion functions. It's not what Christianity is. Christianity is a worldview. It's the gospel. It's more than just religion. More on this in just a moment. But first, let's go back to this image real quick. Take a closer look at what the messages are that are really being conveyed. Let's be discerning. So let's start here. There's only one right way to live. That's the lie, according to this person. What's she really saying? You can live however you want. Whatever feels right for you is right for you. No one else can tell you what to do with your life. It's your life. You live it how you want. Uh, the lie she's saying here, I'm broke, broken and need to be saved. What's the message? I'm just fine. I'm not broken. I don't need to be saved, forgiven, redeemed, anything. Don't diminish me that way. I'm good. I'm good. That's the message. I can trust myself, she's saying. I can trust my gut. I can trust my instincts. I can trust the heart, my heart, when it tells me what to do. I can trust the stars. I can trust myself, or whatever. Like, that's the thing she's saying. I can trust myself. I, I, I'm fine without God is the message here. My desires, not, not only are they not sinful, my desires are good because I have them, so they must be good. Like, that's how this worldview works. My spiritual self is distinguishable from my physical self. And this is basic Gnosticism. Folks, do your homework when you run into something like this. This is one of the oldest heresies in the book. The idea that your physical self and spiritual self can be distinguished from each other and one can be good, the other can be non-existent. Ridiculous. Everything spiritual, we are spiritual beings. But this person wants to push back against this as though it's a lie. And finally, this is the one that gave me the most pause this week. I'm responsible for saving others. At first, I was like, well, she got one out of seven right. Because we're not responsible for saving others. We don't do the saving, right? But what's the message really being conveyed here? It's not on me to share the truth with anyone else. I don't have to worry about other people's destiny or the state of their soul. That's their business. These people, people that believe this way would say that evangelism or proselytizing, sharing the gospel, that that's oppressive. That's a form of, uh, what would they say, colonizing other people. But did you hear what Paul wrote about God's choice to make us his ambassadors, to do the ministry of reconciliation through us? We have a responsibility to share the truth of Jesus with the world around us. But this is sort of typical uh, set of beliefs that uh, the secular worldview leads people to accept. All these are messages that yourself is the priority. Above all else, you are your authority. Your highest authority figure is you. And you are good no matter what, even when you aren't. You can accept the fact that you are because the universe says so, I guess. Your desires are good if they make you happy. If you call something good, it's good for you. And here's the key. If God or God's word or the church or whatever contradicts what you understand to be good for you, you're not the one who's wrong. God is. Because in this worldview, at the end of the day, the highest authority figure is God. And if that's you... Congratulations, I guess. You are your own God. It doesn't tend to work out very well, however, so I would caution you against it. Now, this kind of selfism I'm talking about isn't, isn't exactly new. There's always been selfishness in the human you know, experience, but there's something that has shifted in our culture dramatically since 2010 or about 2010. Social scientists have been like really chewing on this, like what's going on in our culture since 2010? Because since 2010, social scientists and other experts have seen dramatic upticks, like unprecedented upticks in mental illness, especially among young adults. So what's going on? Why are rates of anxiety going through the roof? And why is everyone who's anxious, their anxiety is getting worse the more they try to treat their anxiety? The same goes for depression or self-harm, suicidal ideation. Young adults and teenagers especially are struggling with mental illness like never before. Why? What changed in 2010? Well, the first most obvious answer is what? 
Social media, I heard it. That's the first thing. That started a little bit before 2010, but it really was in an upswing. Facebook first, or I guess MySpace for you Gen Xers. What's up, Gen X? MySpace or whatever. And then, and then it really took off with, with um, you know, the others and TikTok and everything else. And, and so that's one explanation that we talk about a lot. But there's another thing that social scientists point to as a trigger for these spikes in mental illness uh, in our culture. And that we talk about less often, which is the front-facing camera on our phones. This is a change that is like a watershed moment in our culture. We don't think about it very often. Cameras used to pretty much just focus outwardly. And if you wanted to take a selfie, you had to do it in front of a mirror. And you had red eyes usually and uh, rings around your head or something. And it's a different world. Now, front-facing cameras, the first of which came out in 2010, a 0.3 megapixel uh, front-facing camera came out on the first phone in 2010. 10, now they are uh, extraordinary uh, technology and, 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 and can capture photos, videos, etc. And what they have done is increased the rate at which we turn in on ourselves. Cameras used to be for the purpose of outward exposure, revealing the beauty or character of the creation around you, looking at others instead of yourself. And now increasingly cameras are just one more way for us to look at ourselves. And strangely enough, no matter how much we look at ourselves, or the, I would say that the more, the more we look at ourselves, the less we like ourselves. And maybe it's because we're, we're ugly. I don't know. But I think it's deeper than that. The more we look at ourselves and our problems and our flaws compared to other people's airbrushed situations on their social media feeds, for example, the more dissatisfied we've become with ourselves. This is one more example of how we are not good at self-governance, self-sufficiency, or being our own gods. We look at ourselves more than any generation ever has before. The more we do that, the less we seem to love ourselves. Now, as Christians, we shouldn't be surprised when this happens to the world. It shouldn't surprise us when the world has bad ideas. But when those bad ideas clearly are infiltrating the church, we should always perk up and pay attention. When bad ideas infect the hearts and minds of Christians and lead us toward heresy or lead denominations or churches off the beaten path of Christ, then we have to pay attention and call it out. And we see symptoms of this everywhere, or we should. For example, if... And when the most influential Christian leaders, pastors, preachers in our culture look and sound more like cultural celebrities than they do Jesus or the biblical prophets, or when you go to Barnes and Noble or Amazon and, and look for the Christian books that are the best-selling Christian books, and a lot of them seem and sound like they could fit neatly with no conflict whatsoever, in the self-help section of any secular bookstore. Instead of preaching the gospel, they're watering it down for the purpose of selling books. Or if you're a preacher or a pastor or a church leader, I know we preachers always listen and watch other preachers' sermons and stuff. If you're a preacher and listening right now, ask yourself how you prioritize your time through the week. A lot of us have become programmed to prioritize for performative reasons spending the majority of our time during the week getting ready to get up here and put on a show as though that's what you need from us. You don't need another show. The world is full of shows that are better in entertainment value than any preacher could be. What you need is leadership, partnership, friendship, fellowship. The gospel is what you need, and it's what every preacher needs too, but sometimes we get it so twisted we want to put on a show so that people will come and give and grow and all that. It's really not about that. As important as preaching is, that's not it what, what it is about. And it's not just preachers that get off track either. If you look at worship in the same sort of way, through the same lens, as though worship is sort of a show that's meant to keep your attention, that's meant to get you out on time, that's meant to be, you know, uh, your style, uh, your preferred style, Watch out. 
you might be infected with secular selfism. If, for example, sometimes you leave church and go, well, that stunk. That service stunk. You know, that, so I didn't know any of the songs. And the ones I did know, I didn't like them. They were too loud. They missed a note. The word was wrong on the screen. Yeah. Or the preacher wouldn't stop talking. Um, here's your periodic reminder. None of this is for you. You see, you feel it, how deep the selfism has gotten for us, where we assume that coming to church is supposed to primarily bless me. We're here to bless God. The songs are for him. It's your opportunity, us as a community, to lift up our worship and praise to God because worship is the only appropriate posture to take before your master, your Lord, your king, your sovereign. And so that's why we do this. Of course, there's a byproduct of us hopefully learning and growing and getting accustomed to the word and, and the rhythm of worship and all that's good, but the primary purpose of worship is to bless God and worship him and put him where he belongs on the thrones of our hearts instead of looking inwardly for another hour in the week of this selfish, self-centered culture and life that we're living. So if we're going to have a Jesus-centered worldview before we close today, I, I suppose we should look at what Jesus says about ourselves, right? For the purpose of time, I'm going to skip a little bit, um, but you have Matthew chapter 8 on your study guides. I encourage you to look at that one. That's where Jesus basically, I'll paraphrase it, he basically says, if you want to be my disciple, it's not about you. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me, he said. It's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be easy, but it'll be worth it. And then in this other passage from Matthew chapter 20, Jesus outlines the ultimate choice that we all have to make. And if you haven't made it yet, I hope you'll make it today. Here it is. Matthew 20, verse 25 to 28. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Gentiles, secular people. The rulers of secular people lord it over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you church leaders, Christians. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first in the kingdom of God must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the choice. You can serve yourself now, and see God and everybody else in your life as sort of subsidiary servants of you. And that might feel like freedom for a time, but soon enough it turns into the worst kind of slavery. Because you're not made to be a master. You're made to be a servant of God. And the, the, the real problem with this secular worldview of selfism that we're talking about today is that when it falls apart, it falls hard. Because the masters you end up serving, the overlords of this secular society and the spiritual implications of it all are often merciless masters who demand everything of you. And what starts out feeling like freedom ends up being slavery, and if nothing changes, it's eternal slavery. But on the other hand, if you make the choice to make yourself a slave to make Jesus your master, to make the gospel your life's mission, you will find in him a master who is unlike no other, the only master who's ever willingly laid down his life for all people, those who love him and those who don't. He laid his life down for us all the same, the only master you'll ever find who will not exploit you, who will not take advantage of you, who will never extort you, who will only lay down his life for you, so that by making the choice to be his slave, you will find freedom forever. It's the only way to be truly free, is to bend the knee to the only master who loves you more than anyone ever will. 
who loves you more than you even love yourself. You and I aren't made to be the masters of our own lives. I'm not even made to be the best leader of my own family. My highlight of leadership of my family this week was standing in the backyard in my underwear with an umbrella and a lightning storm. It's as good as it got for me this week, but praise God for Jesus. It's not up to me. All I have to do is surrender to his lordship, to be his servant, his slave, instead of seeking my own self-interest first. In that simple choice, there is freedom. Some of you have never known, but you can know it right now. Instead of bending the knee to the secular world and its interests, which are often so merciless, which will have you doing what you're supposed to do and saying what you're supposed to say and voting how you're supposed to vote and posting what you're supposed to post, lest you incur the wrath of the secular overlords you're serving. Instead of all that, you can have freedom in Christ. You can have a master that loves you unconditionally. All you got to do in this moment, say, Lord, I'm done. I've reached the end of myself. Lord, I surrender. Will you make me yours? Will you be my king and my Lord, my sovereign? Let's pray. God, I pray right now, especially, primarily for those who have yet to make the choice to give way at last and surrender and bend the knee to the only Lord who will ever love them back. I pray for those who are on the precipice of that life-altering, earth-shattering decision to surrender to you, to make you the Lord of their lives, to receive you as king and sovereign. Lord, I pray Right now, there are souls in this room changing forever. Futures, trajectories, families being brought back from the precipice of destruction and falling apart, redeemed by your grace, set on the path that leads to life, abundant and eternal. Lord, I pray for the decisions being made right now. I just give space right now for individuals, for people to make that choice, to say, yes, Lord, at last, yes, I'm done. Yes, I'm home. Holy Spirit, just move. Thank you, Father, for your Son, Jesus, in whom everything rests and through whom all things are held together. It's in his powerful name that we pray. Amen.